you know, um, sort of these these ancient um, clay tablets in sort of Mesopotamia and Greece that used to sort of have symbols of sort of meat and etc. And they used to trade these power shells in Africa with the Greek and Roman coins. Uh, we have the uh, silver rings um, from the Celtic uh, Celtic tribes that they trade. trade. And then another very interesting one is the very interesting um, essay on, on sort of economics of trading, of, of using cigarettes as a sort of, um, uh, sort of a currency in the POW camps during the Second World War. Um, and it's by a comes called Ari Radford, and he sort of ran through the whole sort of economic system that built up around the, the use of cigarettes as a sort of trading, uh, a trading currency. So, so as you can see, it's quite a wide variety of of things that have been used in the past um, to uh, uh, exchange things. Um, okay, so money, money essentially is a, an exchange commodity. Its basic premise is that um, is that basically it it is a commodity which is used to exchange things. So it doesn't really have much use beyond that. It, it sometimes can, but um, essentially it it alone is used to to. Um, instead of straight barter to, to uh, facilitate the exchange of things. So um, it is its own kind of special kind of commodity. Um, basically, it needs to be sort of divisible into smaller parts. Um, uh, so these are sort of things that money needs to be. Uh, it needs to be transportable so people can carry it around with them. Um, it needs to be durable because there are people carrying around with them. And it needs to be recognizable and accepted. Um, um, so that people will accept it as a as a form of payment uh, in, in order to give you something else. So these sort of um, we call the sort of the criteria for a, for an exchange commodity. Okay. Um, so if we go back into sort of, call it modern history, but medieval times, the 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 whole idea of this the advent of sort of paper money. Um, and, it, and loans sort of comes from the idea of what we sometimes call fractional reserve lending. Uh, comes from the idea of what the sort of goldsmith um, in medieval medieval times. The goldsmith essentially used to work with with gold, and he would have a vault where essentially um, he was able to store all the gold he was working with. So what people used to do um, is they used to give their gold to the goldsmith, um, who would store it in the vault for them. Uh, and in exchange, he would give them uh, deposit slips. Um, these deposit slips then used to be trans um, um, exchanged within the within the, the medieval city as a form of payment. So um, th this sort of would create this sort of paper money. But essentially, you could then take this deposit slip back to gold, and it would give you the equivalent of gold. So this is how um, sort of our our understanding of paper money came about. Um, but at the same time, the Goldsmith would also just release paper money um, w uh, because essentially deposit slips, um, which he would then give out as loans uh, and sort of, sort of charge an interest rate on. So these would sort of be backed up by the gold in a sense, um, but because only pe people would only withdraw their gold in, let's say, 10% of, of the time. Um, he would always have enough gold to sort of back these loans up. So this is a sort of idea of sort of loans and paper currency um, it sort of comes from that sort of many of the period. Um, <clears throat> so going uh, <laughs> a few centuries later, uh, this is an example of the free banking Scotland, um, free banking system in Scotland um, is quite um, an interesting one, which is it's, it breaks from the sort of fractional reserve lending type idea. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to Scotland, and you'll, you'll probably know that you will have the sort of Royal Bank of Scotland notes, the Clydesdale Bank notes, and the sort of uh, the Bank of Scotland notes. So <coughs> um, every single one of these banks is actually able to issue their own notes, um, which 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 is quite uh, unusual, and obviously trying to bring them back to London to exchange to uh, to get to. Uh, uh, change for it is a little bit tricky, but they are, you know, they are bona fide notes and we used to stop it. So, you know, I think So basically, the idea of the free banking system was that um, there would be these sort of city banks or 
several banks in the city, they would, they would each issue their own notes. Um, and basically, it was used to provide short term loans to businesses. The businesses then would sort of use this money um, uh, for exchanges, and people would then be able to take them back to the, to the bank and, and, um, as, as savings. So it created this circulation of notes that actually worked really well, and Mr. Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations, um, uh, you know, he was commenting on a lot of the economic stuff that was happening um, in England and Scotland at the time. And basically, he basically said that this this whole um, system of free banking had helped the, um, uh, the trading system in Scotland and all this the trade that was happening. So it facilitated a lot of um, uh, business activity and helped helped a lot in, in the Scottish economy. Uh, but unfortunately, next slide. Uh, Central Bank and uh, Bank of England. Bank of England essentially um, was a private bank, but it was a highly centralised private bank, and it, it basically got the right to sell government bonds. So the, the, uh, the government would, um, would want to raise money, uh, it would go to the Central Bank, the Bank of England. Uh, the Bank of England would then use that debt to issue notes, which is the um, which is the pound as we know it, which then sort of got back to, uh, which was sort of used people to, to exchange um, uh, and trade, and then obviously came back um, as taxes to the government. So essentially, what the government would do is, in order to issue these bonds, people would buy these bonds up front, um, and basically it was the promise of paying the taxes for the next, whatever, 10, 20 years, depending on the government bond was that sort of back this bond up. So he created this um, system um, of, of sort of debt-based currency um, and the central bank, Bank of England, was the only was the only bank that was allowed to issue notes. So that they were the only ones that they issued this note was the only note that was to be accepted in the whole of the um, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so that sort of they sort of pushed the sort of free banking system out of out of the equation and um, essentially took over the, the whole uh, system of, of, sort of national currency. Um, so, next. Um, yeah. Sorry, and they could push them out of the way because they were government supported, or why, why were they so strong? How did they get um, so strong? I guess they had the support of the government to start with, and the sort of, they were marginalised. And there, there, there were also quite a few sort of economic failures in Scotland at the time and the Bank of England refused to sort of help them out. Um, so essentially essentially it was it was where they, it was a system where they were like only the sort of the British pound would be accepted. Uh, although the sort of the remnants of that free banking system is still in Scotland and that those banks can still issue notes. But, but essentially them being independent banks has sort of disappeared. They're all tied into the Bank of England uh, now. And so the problems of the central banking system um, is that essentially um, is, is three. Excuse my slides. Um, first of all, there's the issue of the credit multiplier. Um, and if anyone knows that, basically all banks belong to the Bank of England and is the Bank of Banks. Um, so all banks bank the Bank of England, and they need to swap 10% of their uh, deposit base with the Bank of England. Um, and so, yeah. So, so what this creates is a, a credit multiplier effect. So if someone puts 100, 100 pounds into the system, uh, then the bank, the just just call it independent, uh, like a, a local bank, have to put 10 10 percent or 10 pounds with the sort of Bank of England. It then is able to lend up 90. This 90 is then, sort of, let's say, put back into the bank as a sort of savings for later. Um, they then have to put 10 in with, with the Bank of England and then lend up 80. So from this 100, uh, 100 pounds, you can actually then lend it out uh, 10 times uh, the actual amount that actually went in because of this sort of credit multiplier effect. And, and this sort of creates this um, credit as we know it in, in that take a small amount of money and lend it out so many times that it actually creates, well it's not 10 times that amount, but it, let's say about uh, three or four times the amount that's actually come into the system. <coughs> and it's, it's, it's
it's not really based on anything but that sort of fractional reserve idea of sort of goldsmith. Um, so the other one is interest burden. Because money is then based on government debt, um, there is an interest burden attached. So the, 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 the government is, is paying back on its bonds. Um, it's, it's paying back the principal, the initial amount, plus an interest which, which accumulates over time. However, this means that when money, because debt is used to issue money, there is a, 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 an interest burden attached. So this kind of creates this huge interest curve that essentially many economists believe it is our sort of growth imperative. It's one of the main reasons why we sort of have to have growth because there's interest on the money we're using the whole time to generate more value and interest as well as pay back the principal. So it's this whole idea of the interest burden creates a sort of growth imperative. The other one is that the central banking system is quite unresponsive. So they might issue too much money into the system, uh, which then creates inflation. They might not have uh, enough, you know, they might not have not have enough money into the system or liquidity in the system. So essentially, especially in the sort of 19th century, a lot of smaller county banks went bankrupt because the Bank of England wouldn't actually put enough liquidity into the system. So it's sort of like it destroyed a whole lot of banks. They went into bankruptcy because there wasn't enough money in the system. Um, and the other one is, is this sort of a regional favoritism. So um, when the Bank of England sets its interest rates, um, they might, they, they generally sort of favour uh, a certain area, sort of favour the southern sort of rentier sort of landlords type thing, whereas the north sort of needs access to, to credit you know, because the manufacturing centre won't ever, um, ever have that. Uh, well, an interest, a high interest rate won't be favourable to them, whereas it will be to somebody that earns their money from buying government bonds, which would be the sort of, you know, uh, southern parts rather than the north. So this whole idea that one can um, create one currency that is used for a whole country is is quite a um, is a problematic idea because information is I mean uh, money in itself is an information carrier it tells you a little bit about how the economy is doing and what it needs um, but if you're amalgamating it all into one one currency that's supposed to represent the whole area you're going to get all these sort of inefficiencies coming in um, and and so it, it, it makes it fairly unresponsive to sort of local needs. Thank you.